Welcome everyone. This is Professor Rosenthal and today we're going to take a look at the first lesson of our calculus course. Our topic is limits. And just to briefly go over the learning objectives in this lesson, we're going to understand hopefully the concept of a limit as um, x approaches to a finite value such as c. We're going to try to understand or distinguish the differences between finding the function value at a point versus the limit as x approaches to that value. And finally, we're going to try to determine the limit of a function by using either a graph or a table or an equation using the analytical approach. Now, before we dive into some examples and definitions, I thought it might be a good idea to take a, a little bit of a step backwards and go down the history lane and try to understand what motiv motivated mathematicians to dis make discoveries about limits and to develop this concept. So, two historical questions come to mind. One of them was determining instantaneous rate of change. Rate of change turns out to be a very important concept in many different fields. For example, in physics, the rate of change of distance per unit uh, change in time would be velocity or speed. But also in other areas like the change of uh, rate of change of, let's say, profit per unit change in price um, might be marginal profit. Uh, rate of change of a population, uh, you know, there are so many different areas that might use the concept of rate of change, and we'll talk more about this later. But at the moment, let's concentrate on just the speed, at rate of change as a speed. Now, you can have average rate of change. So if this is your function uh, representing the distance of an object from the ground from at any given time t, the average rate of change can be determined by finding basically the slope of the secant line. The secant line is the line joining these two points. So let's say this is your time equals 1, call it t sub 1. This is your time is equal to 2 t sub 2. And if you want to know on the average what was the velocity over this time frame, um, you could actually find the uh, these two endpoints and find the slope of this line. And again, here we're assuming that the vertical axis is distance at any given time. And you could determine how much distance was taken over that time period over divided by the time period. And that will give you the average rate of change at which that distance was traversed. But what if you want to find out about instantaneous speed? And this problem plagued mathematicians for centuries because if you pinpoint that one value, let's say time is equal to three seconds after the object started moving. But at that moment, if you stop the motion, well, you cannot find the speed or the velocity, right? Um, so you, they wanted to know not just the average rate of change, like we did over here, but the instantaneous rate of change, but without having to stop the motion, because at which point they would lose the actual value they were trying to determine. So this was uh, on their mind, and it turns out that to solve this problem, you need to know a little bit about limits, and the idea basically turns out to be that you find the First of all, the average rate of change, let's say, between this time and that time. So you would find the slope of the secant line joining those two points. And then you would let those two points get closer and closer to each other, each time finding this uh, secant line. So what happens is um, the secant lines eventually approach the tangent line as the time increment between two points becomes smaller and smaller. So if you're trying to find it, uh, what happens exactly at time is equal to three. So you could find a time, um, you could find a velocity between, let's say, 2.5 and 3.5, then between 2.9 and um, 3.1, and between 2.99 and 3.01. And you see where we're going with that. And then basically you're taking a limit as the, um, the time increment change in time is approaching towards zero and we're zooming into that one point and if you now have to find the rate of change of a uh, between two points which we already know from algebra right because the average rate of change is the slope of a secant line which we now have to find simply it's going to be a rise or a run so by taking a limit of the slopes you will find the slope of the tangent line we'll do a lot more about this later at the moment don't worry if you don't follow it uh, just understand that the concept of a limit will be needed to solve this, this ma mathematical dilemma. 
And here is another one, another historical question that required the concept of a limit. And this was finding area under a curve. So suppose you have the function y equals f of x, and you want to find the area under it. Of course, we know how to find area of a well-known geometrical figure, such as a rectangle, such as a triangle, and so forth. But what do you do if the region is not a well-known region? So let's take a look at the historical development of this concept. So around 200 BC, Archimedes came up with an idea and published a paper. And what he did was, for example, to find the area within a circle, he inscribed a polygon within a circle. So this polygon happens to have six different sides, right? It's a hexagon. And he found the area of each of the circles. Uh, rather each of the triangles and added up those areas to get an approximation. But you might say, what about all these areas that, that are not covered? For example, this little area here is not going to be counted for this little area and so forth, right? So what he did was he increased the number of sides uh, gradually. So here we had six sides in our polygon. Here we have another polygon with more sides. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. So six sides on the top, six on the bottom. So this one has 12 sides, or maybe it would be called a dodecagon or something like that, right? So the idea is, you see, the, the, the parts that we're not covering are much less now. You see, th th these gaps are much, much smaller. So as you increase the number of sides of your polygon, um, you're getting a much better approximation for the area of a circle. Now, you might say, well, can we continue this even further? Can we have a polygon of more and more sides? And the answer is yes. That's exactly what Archimedes did. And as a matter of fact, let me show you what I found from Wikipedia. He actually, in his paper that he published around 250 BC on the measurement of a circle, was the title of his paper, and in his Proposition 3, he basically uh, talked about a polygon of 96 sides. So he was able to increase the number of sides up to 96. Imagine there are no calculators, and he was able to determine the area of a polygon of 96 sides to get a very good approximation for the area of a circle. As a matter of fact, in this paper, he established the value of pi between this number and that number. So that's an extremely good approximation to what we know for the value of pi today. Now, that was 250 BC. So 250 BC, and he already had 96-sided polygon. However, mathematicians did not make a big leap in his discovery, in his methods, up until around 1600 and 70s. Roughly, this is uh, when there were a lot of developments uh, in, in calculus, uh, two major mathematicians, one is Newton and the other one is Leibniz, are credited for the development of calculus. So imagine between 200 BC or 250 BC to roughly 1650, 1670 um, AC, there was not a lot of um, progress made uh, with um, uh, Archimedes' methods. But what happened around this time is the seeds of calculus were uh, put, and not only they were able to increase it uh, to 96 or beyond 96, they went to infinitely many sides. You might say, what does an infinitely sided polygon look like? Well, we don't necessarily know what it looks like, but what we know is that if you could truly have infinitely many sides in your polygon, it would almost look like a perfect circle because the sides would match your circle. So as n goes to infinity, as the number of sides of your polygon go to infinity, you're going to have almost a perfect coverage of the circle. It's going to be almost um, the circle itself. So that will give you an exact area of a circle. And that's what uh, Newton and Leibniz did as they were developing calculus. They discovered and expanded on the concept of a limit, limit as n, number of sides of this um, polygon go to infinity. And the notation they used was this. We're going to talk more about this later. Limit as n goes to infinity of, let's say, a sub n area of a polygon using n sides. So in that limiting case, we're going to find a perfect coverage, um, perfect area of that circle. So you might write something like this. In general, 
both of these two historical questions will, uh, relied on the solution to them, relied on understanding the concept of a limit, and that's what we're going to do in the next section. We're going to delve into the concept of a limit and start from ground up and understand how to determine the limit of a given function. So that will be in the next segment.